Hello, everybody, and welcome to the Science of SAS Startups podcast. Uh, today, I'm talking to Hannah Wardenmeyer. Hannah is the uh, VP of Global Partnerships for UserCentrics, which is a, a consent management platform. They've received $21 million across two rounds of investment so far. Hannah, welcome. Hey, everyone. <laughs> <laughs> um, I'd like to just start off by just asking you a, a few questions just to help the audience get to know you as a person a little bit better. So you can just answer these in, in kind of one or two word answers. So the, the first one is what thing have you most been missing during the, the lockdown period over the last year? Meeting friends. Yeah. Do you prefer home office or office office? That's a difficult one. I cannot answer in two words. <laughs> it really depends. I, I, I started in I, I started working in home office actually as a first employee within user centrics. Um, and it was a kind of a proof of concept before Corona even started. Um, so I am comfortable in home office situation. However, um, I miss the team a lot and I miss being in an office atmosphere. For me, the optimal case really would be um, splitting it, being like one or two days in home office and the other days spending with the team in the office um, of user centrics. Yeah, I know what you mean. I, I've never worked at home before, like the last year. And uh, and once I did it, I actually really enjoyed it. <laughs> but now like I went back to our office uh, probably about two or three three or four weeks ago and it's amazing how just quickly you adapt yeah. to, to going back to the other way like uh, first yeah. day back it was like being at school again but now yeah. you know it's just totally normal so yeah okay next one is um what what's your favorite type of restaurant italian restaurants yeah do you prefer winter holidays or summer holidays summer holidays <laughs> yeah. that's a clear one <laughs> and face-to-face -face customer meetings or zoom for life Face to face. Yeah, you're still missing those. Yes, yes. Okay. Still missing them. Well, um, and it makes a change, you know. I mean, it's fine with all these, you know, Zooms of the world, but it's just so different meeting face to face. Yeah. And it becomes so tiring as well, like just doing back-to-back -back Zoom meetings yeah. all day. I think everybody's found that, haven't they? But um, okay, well, I mean, we can perhaps talk a bit more about the, the changes in, in work set up for everybody. But um, but first, I just wanted to kind of dig into to user centrics a bit. And I think, you know, the software industry has been dominated for so long by the US and the American market. And for most of my career, like working with fast-growing staff startups like i've forever been looking across the atlantic to, to the next big thing but i think that's definitely changed in in recent years i think there, there's 70 uh, tech unicorns now in in europe and we've seen some amazing german examples recently like with signavio and got a billion dollar acquisition by, by sap and solonis had a, a billion dollar series d uh last week which is a you know amazing uh a uh, big investment and user centrics is the the latest in a, in a long line of, of successful German startups now they focus on addressing those consent challenges for, for marketers in the post GDP, GDPR world and you know I, I see a lot of different software companies in, in my line of work and and I have to say this one really stood out for me straight away as being like a really innovative solution to the problem so Hannah, do you want to kick us off and just give us a bit of an overview of, of user centrics and what, what you guys are trying to do? Definitely, definitely. Uh, and thanks for the introduction. So yeah, user centrics is a content management platform based or headquartered out of Munich. Currently we're based all over the place, um, which is nice. And what we really try to solve is um, the challenge that everyone is facing in regards to data protection and privacy. Um, but also in relation to data, data strategy, right? So what we like to call our mission is we bring um, the marketing and the legal requirements in harmony, right? It's really not only about legal, it's really about business, making sure that you gather clean data, constanted data in order to be successful, right? In order to be able to use that data. Because in fact, everyone and every company out there is to some extent data driven. And it gets more and more important. And if we look at the changes happening in the industry with the death of the cookie, the importance of first party data, all of that, 
um, we see that the whole industry is going into into like a safer direction. And we as user centrics really see ourselves as a facilitator in in offering a tool and making it easier for companies to comply with the law, but at the same time, you know, see the opportunities when it comes down to um, future data strategies. And in, in terms of like, as you've grown the company over the recent years, is there, is there an even split between the size of companies that you work with, or have you seen like a faster adoption from like the bigger companies or the smaller? It's a very good question and it's a very luxurious problem that we have because everyone like starting from a very small mom pop shop from from around the corner uh, who has a website uh, the yellow pages of the world like everyone needs somehow content management up until you know Porsche, Zalando, Daimler, you know big brands um, that that face the same problem. The only difference is that um, obviously the the effort that needs to be put in and, and the um, the implementation being done differs obviously from from a smaller customer to like the big brands um but in fact adoption wise and and from a vertical perspective and, and even from 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 a market opportunity perspective for us everyone is a potential customer and we do see that really also the small clients as well as the big ones do really care about this topic because in fact it's their customers you know it's the end customer it's the end client who cares it's the data of your customers, of the customers of, you know, any small company um, that those companies should care about. And, and that's what they do. And that's what's great, you know, that, that we see a lot of movement in, in any market. And we're all customers ourselves, right, as well. You know, when we go to other different companies, so you want to kind of think that they're, they're kind of treating your data in, in the right way. So with, with the smaller companies, do you have like more of a, a kind of a plug and play option and then the bigger companies you know it's a lot more kind of customizable to, to their organization and, and their specific needs yeah correct so i mean obviously i'm leading our uh, partner ecosystem team at user centrics so um what we're really trying to do is scale um the long tail and smaller clients through partners we have an extensive partner network uh with whom we serve a smaller clients um one string is really the agencies that you know serve their clients they act as a trusted advisor so it's big potential for for partners and agencies to really jump on this thought leadership uh, topic um, and at the same time working with platforms e-commerce platforms cms system website building platforms um that serve you know thousands of clients and and then they can serve them at scale with a content management solution you know and offer an additional value to their partners and, and customers. So really at user centrics, um, in a nutshell, we, we do have this indirect sales approach and the scaling through partners. And at the same time, uh, we do have an enterprise and mid market sales team uh, that obviously serve clients directly. So it's just a, a, a twofold approach to, to really tackle the market. When you're talking to companies, do you, do you see companies out there who are trying to build their, their own solutions to this content management or are there kind of blockers to doing that? Yeah, it's a very good question. And it's a very interesting development that we've seen in the last couple of months and years, because what happened at the beginning is that a lot of a lot of customers now customers, a lot of companies um, have started looking into this themselves, right? It was it was a lot of discussions that we had make or buy. And um, a lot of them came back to us telling us, you know, we'll just try ourselves and we'll just build a content management platform ourselves because it's an important topic for us, which in fact is good in the first place, right? What happened though, is that a couple of months later, they came back saying that, you know, in fact, it's just too complex to maintain because, you know, the cookie banner that we, as you know, website visitors see is just the front end. It's just the, the one thing. However, what happens in the background is really making sure that data is really only gathered and tracked after you have given consent. Like require all the requirements of the GDPR need to be fulfilled within the software. And it ends basically with the whole documentation around it and making sure that you store and, and, and document the consent in the right way, um, which makes it hard for for, for companies to develop it all on their, on their own, right? And what adds complexity is the different regulations and the different interpretations. Like even with GDPR, looking at the different countries, you know, um, there's slight, slight differences in the interpretation of GDPR. 
And if we now look at the US market, at Brazil, at Japan, you know, at South Africa, like everyone launching their privacy uh, regulations, it will be almost impossible for someone who's not who's not their core business to really make sure that you comply with all the different um, requirements and, and laws popping up, basically. Yeah, I mean, I, I was watching um, a video that you did, a, a talk on, on YouTube, uh, just as part of my research. And I have to say, I hadn't realized just as a customer that a lot of these kind of banner pop ups, you know, when uh, that are asking for consent, when you visit a website, are not really doing anything. You know, they're, they're just like a graphic to, to kind of tick a box um, at the beginning. And that was quite a surprise, actually. So there's yeah. obviously a, you know, a huge amount, you know, more that goes into kind of managing consent, you know, rather than just, a, you know, a graphic when you when you visit a website. Exactly. And it's funny that you're mentioning it, because in my opinion, um, there's a lot of education to be done. Uh, education in a sense of, you know, educating our customers, so our clients on that topic and what can be done, you know, that, what, what kind of challenges we see, however, also what kind of opportunities uh, potential clients have, right? And then there's another level to it, which is, again, the end customer, you know, for the end customer to understand what does this banner even mean, you know, what, what's the consequence of me accepting or denying, like, this is something that a lot of people have not really understood, like even me talking to my mom or something, she wouldn't understand that it's not about getting or getting advertisement, yes or no, it's about what kind of advertisement you get, right, it's about personalization, it's about personal data that is being processed and tracked and I have the feeling that like, still, even though we we are you know dealing with this topic since now more than three years, there's a lot of uncertainty and a lot of vague knowledge in in those markets. I think you know just as a consumer myself, it's very easy for everybody just to become blind to those pages that that pop up because you know they were new three years ago and and everybody was kind of looking at them a bit. But now you know we visited. 20,000 websites since that started and you know on every page it, it kind of pops up you know what do you think kind of needs to happen to kind of keep it top of mind and keep people kind of informed and engaged about what what these kind of banners mean yeah personally and that's also what we you know um recommend and pitch as a best practice is make it personal like it's it's really about actual people behind the screen you know like surfing in the internet and we do see a lot of standardized banners that you know like you said you get blind about because right now it's normal that those banners pop up all the time but and and then you just pick something you know just to get rid of it because people don't understand what what it actually means and what i told partners and, and I tell them still is make it personal like when, when you think about opt-in optimization when you think about how can I really make the customer engage and, and potentially you know increase my opt-in rate just treat them as people visiting your website you talk to them through this banner it's like the first impression they get and even making it a little bit funnier you know like in order to grasp their their attention is totally fine it's a law it's dry it's complicated but still yeah. if you want you want to talk to them, you know, you want them to understand what's actually happening. And I don't see this very much very often because people just, you know, copy what they see and that's how it all, you know, started. But I think there's a lot of potential still in, in customizing the banners and, and making it personal, explaining to your clients what's actually happening. So when you visit a website and, and you like have a pop up come up, like, do you agree or do you look for more information? Like, what, what's the prudent approach? What should we be doing like when, when we go and visit these different websites? Yeah, I think there's no real what you should and what you shouldn't do because people have different um interests and, and and people see privacy differently, you know, to, to what extent, how important it is for them and, and to them. Um, obviously, as I'm in the industry and, and obviously as we as user centrics, we do content management. Mostly I click around a little bit like I'm really interested if it's not our banner. Um, I do challenge a little bit and I click around and I and I look for frauds and, 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 and you know how, how they have implemented it. Um, I do mostly accept because I like to get personal ads. Um, I prefer to be shown the products that I want to see and, 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 and that fit to my to my profile. 
Um, however, not always. Like it also really depends on the brand. It, it, it depends on the, you know, on the actual website. It depends also, you know, am I just looking for something super quickly or am I, you know, specifically taking the time to serve in the internet? So it's, it depends a little bit on my own customer journey that I'm doing. Like what's the intent of surfing in the internet right now? Um, and obviously also I'm very happy when I see the user centric spanners, um, which happens more often, which is, which is cool. And the nicest thing in fact, is sometimes that friends or family, they, they send you screenshots to be like, ah, oh, look, I just, I just saw you guys on that website. And, and it's just nice to see, uh, the market share increasing and seeing our solution, um, being the trusted solution for so many clients. Yeah. And, and as the, the content management industry grows and, you know, I guess you're seeing new competitors kind of enter this market. Do you see them as being like kind of new standalone companies that focus on this and this only? Or do you see companies coming from other markets? Like, you know, I'm wondering whether kind of cybersecurity companies like governance, risk and compliance or, or even MarTech, like, you know, where, where do you see these companies coming from? Yeah, very good question. Uh, obviously, there's a lot of standalone uh, companies um, popping up and we love competition like it's the best thing that can happen to us like it just shows that the market is hot and and there's so much potential so it's, it's just great that a lot of you know competitors and companies are focusing on this topic and just you know gives us um, a scale up as well um, what we see especially also in terms of you know I, I can I can speak from a partner management perspective you know what kind of partners are approaching us um, in need for content management, which they could, in fact, if they, you know, would decide of make or buy, could build themselves. And it's definitely what you've just mentioned, privacy platforms like um, cybersecurity, um, but also, you know, platforms that have focused more on the, on the legal part of it. And that have also seen that content management is quite a complex topic and it's just so, individual that it sometimes just fits as a separate thing to integrate and that's what we offer them yeah. then and the other thing is um if we look at for instance tech management systems or tracking um, martech the keyword that you've mentioned is is equally crucial and again here we we have an extensive partner network because for those players it's going to be important to 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 have this 360 degree, right, in a, in a sense of customer journey, in a sense of the product that they're offering. If you only offer tracking without taking care of how you track, if it's legally compliant the way you track, you're not going to win over clients. Like, it's just something that every, you know, new prospect would ask. It's in all of the RFIs, you would find content management. Like, can you tick the box? So obviously, those MarTech players, tech management systems, also e-commerce platforms, they need to check the box in order to win or, or to go through this RFI. Uh, and in order to check the box, they have again two options, right? They can, they can build it themselves or they can partner up um, with, with a content management platform as such as ours. Um, so in order to answer your question, it's, it's very broad. Like we see it in the legal industry, but we also see it in the MarTech and uh, analytics industry. Okay. And, and pri privacy, pri privacy is obviously increasingly being used as a, like a brand differentiator now. Like mm -hmm. we, obviously Apple being the most famous one is like actively trying to kind of take a different route on privacy, kind of separating themselves from like the, the Android platform. Do you see consent management as just a legal regulatory issue or do you see it as something that could be part of the, the brand building and, and driving rev revenue for, for your customers as well? Definitely second one. It's, it's part of our value proposition. It's part of our pitch because we really believe in it. And there's very interesting studies by Boston Consulting Group and, and other consultancies that have basically proven that trust and, you know, privacy builds trust and trust you know, builds your brand image and, and increases your brand value. So there's a, there's a, you know, direct um, relationship between the different topics here. And we've seen it with service that we've done ourselves. We've seen it with customers and partners that we talk to. Um, interestingly enough, we did a survey, you know, when Corona started at the very beginning, um, we, we asked a lot of people how much data, personal data would they uh, be willing to hand over in order to fight a pandemic and it was scarily uh, 
enough to look at the results and seeing that not all of them would be willing to hand over personal data. And we've seen that in the discussions, I mean, now it's kind of old, this, this question, right? Because we've seen the discussion with the tracking and tracing apps and everything that's happening currently with yeah. um, shops opening again. So privacy is so important. And if you show your customers that you care and, and you build this trust with your end customer, um, they, they, they will retain, they will maintain, you know, it's, it's a retention tool. And on top of it, um, it's obviously an indirect revenue player, definitely. Yeah, I noticed at user centrics, there's a whole bunch of ex Googlers. And I, I wondered if that was because they kind of disagreed with that kind of direction that, that Google was taking on privacy and wanted to, to kind of forge a different path with, with user centrics. I would totally uh, disagree. Um, because in my opinion, Google does a lot in that sense as well, um, investing a lot in privacy. I would even spin it exactly the other way around because they see at Google how important it is. You know, they, you know, are open for for special players in the market that focus on that topic. You know, even okay. even more, yeah. even further, like most, not more, but more specifically. Um, and on top of that, I guess we're just doing good HR, good hiring. Uh, so, so kudos, kudos to our HR team. And obviously, you know, when you have specific um, people in the team that show also the connection, you know, coming from the IT industry, coming from a very data driven um, company and seeing the connection, like grasping the, the, the opportunities that we have and the opportunity in the market, I guess um, it just speaks for, for the product. It speaks for the industry that people from Google are also switching um, to a startup like ours, like Usocentrics, right? Yeah, no, absolutely. So I wanted to kind of move on to kind of dig into to kind of startup life, if you like. So um, at Usocentrics, as I mentioned earlier, you've been through two rounds of funding now. Um, I think you're just over 120 people now. Is that right? In the company? Right. But they, they were much, much smaller when you joined. Um, like I think you mentioned earlier, you were the first employee. Correct. So uh, like, Correct. how does it... How does it feel to go from, I think you were at Salesforce before, you know, I think 50,000 employees to being number one on the ground. Like, how does that feel? Crazy. <laughs> <laughs> it, it, it was a very, very um, crazy journey, but I, I never, I never regretted it. Like, it was just so interesting to, to see the, the, the company grow. We started in a, in a WeWork space, like a super small office. Uh, which we grew out in a couple of weeks already. We moved to a small office where in the end we were sharing desks with like three people because, you know, we just we just grew too fast. And then we had this wonderful, beautiful office uh, in the heart of Munich that we that we moved to. Um, actually, in fact, mid of February, and it was just one or two weeks that we were in the office when Corona hit, uh, which is super sad. And during Corona, we just grew so fast that we outgrew the office that we barely have been into. Um, so it's, it's, it's been just so, um, so exciting, the whole, the whole journey. Right. And it's been a great challenge as well, to be completely honest, because just growing so fast, remote onboarding, remote team building, um, you know, there's, there's, I guess, 80% of the company that I've never seen face to face. Uh, it, it's a big challenge. Like even team members, members of my team that I haven't yet personally met. Um, and now obviously with you know, the Corona becoming better with, with the vaccines and everything happening, we, we need to shift back, right? At some point we need to switch back to face-to-face. -to -face. We need to go back to the office. It's gonna be strange just like meeting all these people that we've worked with for a year <laughs> yeah. now, meeting for the first time, uh, but I'm very, very excited about it. Yeah, I mean, coming from like a sales force, you know, what, what are the, do, do you feel like there are lessons you can learn from that big company that, that you can bring to, to a startup? Like what, what, what were you able to kind of bring straight away in terms of that mindset? Yeah, I think what definitely helped me learning um, at Salesforce is that you need processes. Um, I mean, obviously, as a startup, you need to be fast. You need to act fast. Um, but especially with a fast grown startup, at some point, you need to focus on, on the basis, on processes, which you... Um, which you learn and which you see in, in big corporations such as Salesforce, right? And those obviously help a lot and you can adapt them um, and, and bring them to the company. 
Another big thing that I learned and which I'm very grateful for is that culture has a big impact. Uh, a corporate culture is crucial for a company to be successful. I'm, I'm totally 100% convinced of that. And management and leadership. So being a good leader, having, good, having a good leadership team, building a culture in a company where people feel comfortable in, where people see potential to grow um, is one of the main success drivers in my opinion for, for, for a company and that's that's what i um what i learned at salesforce which i'm again very very grateful for because they do have a very strong com corporate culture and and we could in fact incorporate a couple of those things that that we've done at salesforce and like when, when you joined the company like how much did you know about user centrics like when, when you joined um, you know, how, how do you go about evaluating the, the risk and reward of making that jump from a, you know, a huge tech leader like Salesforce to, you know, a total startup that you joined in, in user centers? Yeah, it's a very difficult question. And it was, in fact, a very difficult decision. Um, and, and people have called me crazy, you know, leaving a safe harbor uh, <laughs> yeah. to, to, to a company that did not really exist yet. And it was really... Um, I saw the potential in the market and it was funny because GDPR was all, all around, like everyone was discussing about it because it, it, it was just about to happen. And, and I said, look, everyone is struggling with it. Everyone is looking for solutions. And I got, to, I got pitched by Misha. Um, I founded a company that has the solution and it just resonated with me. I was like, this is interesting. You know, like everyone, everyone literally is, is, dealing with this topic and, and you're telling me you have a solution i want to know more about it and then and then we talked and then we had a couple of discussions and um to be frankly honest initially i i, I thought about you know just joining as a, as a part-time you know just helping out initially and, and supporting them a little bit and very soon like after a couple of uh, days and, and weeks I, I knew okay i can either be all in or not you know it just doesn't work in a startup to just be just half committed and then I said, I have nothing to lose. Like um, I had a very good position at Salesforce. I had a good relationship with, with my boss and, and my colleagues back then. And they told me, you know, Hannah, if you need to do it, I was completely transparent. And they said, if, if you need to do this journey and this adventure, go for it. Um, try, fail, succeed, whatever happens. Um, if possible, there will always be a, a place for you here at, at, at Salesforce. You know, there's no hard feelings. We love the boomerangs. Yeah. They told me. And then I said, I have nothing to lose. Like, I, I can just really go and try. And I did. And here I am three years later. So, um, and yeah. looking back, yeah. No, I mean, that, that's something, you know, I, I kind of say to candidates all the time, you know, when they're thinking about that, that kind of risk reward issue is that there's always going to be a job for you back at a sales force or, a, you know, where, wherever you've come from. Um, but you may never get that opportunity again, you know, to join because it's so different joining it when you did to someone joining user centrics now, you know, the challenges and the learning experience is like completely different. I mean, how have things evolved? Like, you know, what, what are the, the kind of big daily issues when you were 10 people to versus, you know, when you're 100 people? It's really what I've mentioned earlier, right? It's really keeping the culture up. It's really building processes. Um, it's communication, transparency. Obviously, now the remote situation adds complexity to it. Um, but, you know, building the teams, um, cross-functional collaboration, communication, transparency, making sure everyone is walking in the right direction and in the same direction, basically, uh, is, big, is a big challenge in such a fast-growing team. And again, everyone being remote and, and the lack of, you know, this um, quick alignments that you usually do on the hallway or, or in the office, it, it, it just it's missing. And that's, it's a big challenge, in fact. Yeah. OK, so I've just got one last question because I'm, I'm very mindful of your time. Um, so what advice would you give to somebody right at the beginning of their career? They, they've just joined a startup and, you know, I guess it can be a little overwhelming you know, how, how do you maximize your chances of success? Is it just work hard and sink or swim? Or is there like a way to plan for success in that, that kind of chaotic startup world? Yeah, I mean, in a startup, usually there, there, there is a lot of work, in fact. Um, but I wouldn't say you, you need to, you know, do so many over hours or work so hard, you know, that it, that it burns you. I, 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 I don't agree with that. 
However, I think it's really about ownership. It's showing initiative and it's, it's being a little bold, you know, it's just, you know, try and fail. It's being fast and, and not being shy of, you know, coming up with ideas, you know, pitching ideas, thinking outside of the box. So I think you really have to dare, um, dare, try and fail. And, and that's how, how you will succeed in a startup, in my opinion. Ownership. Yeah. No, I, I love it. You know, dare, try and fail. Because, um, you know, the reason I called this like the science of SaaS startups, because I really see it as being, you know, experimentation is the beauty of startups, really. You know, just kind of finding your truth, like about the market. Yeah. Um, yeah. You know, and that's what sort of really fascinates me about the, this kind of whole world, really. Well, um, it's been really great having you on, Hannah, and thank you for, for joining us today. Um, if people want to kind of discuss user centrics with you, what, what's the best way to get in touch? Um, best way to get in touch is old school email, I guess. Um, yeah. and, then, and then we'll just see and potentially see us face to face or otherwise in, in Zoom or Hangouts whatsoever to discuss any synergies or joint opportunities. Yeah. Okay. Perfect. Well, we've covered uh, a lot of ground today and all the best for, for your next stage of growth. And um, yeah, maybe we can get you back on in a, a year or two and you can tell us about, you know, all, all the rest of the journey. That will be very exciting. Yeah. Thanks, Ben, so much for having me. Yeah, no worries. Okay. Thank you, Hannah. Bye.